Hello. Hello. Thanks. So um, I started doing Elixir in uh, 2014, I think. And the first thing I did, uh, so I go on the website and it says uh, massively, build massively concurrent systems and uh, distributed stuff. And I said, like, I don't know, I don't have any need for massively, I don't know what to do with that. So I started just doing like small things and doing some, I don't know, uh, coding exercises. And for, like the first proper thing I built in Elixir was uh, a library. And then I, I did that and then and it was a very shitty one. Uh, and then I did one more and it was a bit better. And then I did one more and it was a bit better. And I've been doing that since. Uh, so fast forward now, which is 2017, and I've done like a few. Um, and the hope is that I learned a bunch of stuff uh, in the process and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so what I wanna talk about mainly is like, uh, what is a software library? Why do we write software libraries? Why do I write software libraries? My experience in writing them. Uh, and um, talk about how, how you, like just tips uh, and the stuff that I learned about writing a software library. Um, so I bought this remote and I'm afraid that I'm gonna like walk off the stage and fall down because this stage is like ridiculously small. So if you see me fall down, I, I mean, it's okay. Um, that's me staring into the, the functional programming heaven. Uh, uh, I work at a, so that's my, my username. Uh, I work at a company called Forza Football. Um, so we do uh, like a football app with live scores and stuff. And uh, uh, I don't care about football at all. Like that's soccer, but if you're, like, if you're American. So I don't care about football at all. Um, but it's okay because we really like, this is just like a short term goal. The, the long, -term ter long term goal is actually getting all the core team members to work for us. So harvesting, we don't know what to do um, with them yet, but we're gonna, we're gonna get them all. Uh, we're gonna catch them all, of course. Um, so three of, three, three of those already work there. I'm, I'm one. So I'm in the Elixir core team. Um, so how was this, this intro? Was it okay? Because I, <laughs> I did the same talk. I did the same talk in San Francisco, and I did a like, much longer, much funnier, much like, more, more interactive uh, intro to the talk. And I got, then the, com the talk got uploaded on YouTube, and I got one comment. So thanks, Sasha. Okay. <laughs> I hope you like this one, just, I really hope you like this one. Not, like, not even, like, no capital letters, no, like, just worst, worst, okay. So I hope this one was better. Uh, <laughs> so let's get to the, to the stuff. Um, what is a software library, how, how do you write one? Um, so our first thing is what, uh, so what, so how many of you use the software library? More, yeah, it's all, of the, it's all of them, but someone doesn't want to uh, raise their hands. Uh, how many of you wrote software library? Oh, that's nice. So you know, uh, you probably know what it's for, uh, why we do that. Uh, so the, the, the reason we do that is because uh, I think the key word is abstraction. So we do, we do write software libraries to abstract stuff. Um, and I think like in my, in my experience, and in my experience with, yeah, like writing libraries and um, using libraries, of course, um, and reading the code of libraries. I think there are two main, two main categories of libraries uh, that we end up writing. Um, and they, they try to abstract two, like, opposite, like two poles of, of things. Um, and I think the first kind of library you can write is the library that abstracts complex code. So this is, Complex code, I mean, just code that is easy to get wrong, that is uh, full of corner cases, that is uh, that's not application specific in any way, so uh, it can be extracted, uh, but it's just like, you know, you just code that you have to drill, drill down and, uh, and get right, and it takes like testing. Uh, so this is like complex code, and a good, good example, I guess, uh, is something like um, a database driver. Uh, so that's just, that's just comp like you need to write code to talk to the database, so you need to write code that encodes according to the database protocol. Um, you, know, you need to write code that uh, uses the network to talk to the database. So this is all complex stuff. Um, oops, this is all complex stuff that uh, doesn't really. Um, it's just like code that no, like you don't want to write multiple times. You just want to write it once uh, and then use that. 
so this is the first, first category, so you abstract away complex code. Um, but the interface is simple. This is the idea. Like you, the code you abstract is, is um, can be intricate, but the uh, interface is just like the bare minimum. And then there's like another kind of libraries, which is uh, libraries that abstract patterns and ideas. I think. Uh, so the other th thing you want to abstract is this. So when you when you do um, when you write uh, software and you do um, you recognize start recognizing problems uh, and start thinking about ideas on how to solve those problems and, and thinking about ideas that can shape the way you solve these problems, then you, you can abstract those ideas and you can build libraries that actually guide you uh, to solve, like tell you how to solve a problem instead of giving you the tools uh, to solve it. They, they more sh they shape the way you uh, solve the problem. Uh, so this, this is the two, two types of things, so abstracting complex code, abstracting um, ideas and patterns. Uh, a good example of pattern is like stuff from OTP, like, like Gen Server is a good example, I think, because it's not a lot of, so if you read the uh, Gen Server, uh, it's, it's not ter terribly complex code. It's just that it, it but it introduces um, like a concept. It tells you how to shape a generic server. So it, it's introducing, I think the value is more the ideas that it's introducing more than the uh, implementation, because implementation is not, again, not terribly uh, complex. So I tried to coin terms for these two types of libraries, I couldn't find good ones. So the first kind I'm going to call, let me handle this for you, which means uh, like libraries that you give, you give it stuff and they do the like heavy lifting um, and they like d reply stuff back or do stuff. Uh, and again, a good example is database drivers, I think. So this is, I'm going to like, I have two extremes. Uh, I have one very, very complex, and uh, not very, but uh, one library that is mo almost only complex code handling and very few API, and I have another library that is mostly API and very few code, very like, little code. So the, an example of, a, of a, like, let me handle this for you library, so a library that abstracts complex code, um, which is not necessarily complex, but I mean, uh, abstracts code with a, with a small API, but abstracts like code that is error prone and, and everything is Redix, which is a um, Redis client um, for Elixir that I wrote. Uh, and so this Redis client, this is like basically the API. So you start, you start a connection and that's a, connect, a socket connection to Redis. Uh, and then you issue commands to Redis and you get response, responses back. So this is, like, this is basically the, the whole API. Um, and it's pretty simple. But when you do uh, start link, a bunch of stuff happens. So you uh, connect to Redis, you negotiate the protocol. When you do command, you do encoding, you do send the uh, thing, you handle concurrent requests from multiple clients um, to the same uh, Elixir connection. You decode when the, you wait for the response to come back, you decode, you route to the correct client. So there's a bunch of code that's going on behind the scenes when you call that. But the API is really, is re I'm not introducing any, any, any new concept or I'm not introducing any idea. So uh, this is like one extreme. Um, and the other type of library on the other stream is, uh, I call, here's how you handle this, which means um, libraries that tell you, so here's how you handle, here's how you solve this problem. Um, and I give you just the tools to, sh to shape the solution, the tools to um, make it look like I want to, but uh, it's not like a lot of code. And f my personal, personal uh, library, example that does this uh, is a library that I re re released recently. It's called Sol. It's like a validation and, and conformation library, kind of like uh, closure, what ClojureSpec does, if you know. Um, and this library just um, basically used to validate data and conform data to a certain shape. So, um, and the idea is that, so the code for the library is, is, is not a lot. It's very like little code. But the, con the concept that it introduces is the concept of a validator, and a validator is like, like a, can be a Boolean function, or it can be a function that returns um, a, an updated, like a conformed term. And this, uh, so the idea of a validator is basically what's the value of Sol, what Sol provides, and the code that it actually provides is just the ways to combine these validators. So one off, for example, is like a validator combinator that combines the two validators. And so the idea is that um, like the, the real value, I think, that this library provides is just the idea, idea of validators. It, doesn't, it provides basically zero validators. It only provides ways to combine the, like primitive ways to combine those validators. 
uh, and then you build everything else on top of that, but it gives you a tool to shape the problem you're, you're trying to solve. So if you, it tells you this is how, uh, like write validators and combine them to do data validation. Um, so it's not a lot of code, but it's, it packs like ideas mostly uh, more than code. Uh, and this, these two kinds of libraries, they, they usually, uh, there's, not, there's no hard line between them. So they're, there's, they're two extremes, but the most, I would say most of the stuff is kind of like, lean, it's a bit in between. So it leans, it, most libraries lean on one side or the other, uh, but there's no, um, like they usually they're, they're not uh, on the, on the ex like uh, opposite poles. Um, but I do think that uh, when you write a software library, when you use a software library, it's good to think where this library belongs between the two, because it, like, it, it, it helps you, um, I don't know, put into frame what the library is for, or if you're writing it, it helps you design it. Because you say, okay, this is a libra library that just abstracts away hard code. I don't want to deal with a complex API, I just want to do that part. And then I do the API on top, or as a, as a separate thing, or in my application, and same thing for the, for the other, I, so if you're introducing ideas, I ju you don't just want to introduce ideas, you don't want to provide, I don't know, tons of code, tons of code to uh, solve, like, solve that problem um, either. So, um, so this is like, uh, leads us to the next point, which is how to design a social library. So the first tip was this, so try to, I think it's good to try to like uh, categorize, categorize your library and see if it belongs uh, either in the in the abstracting complex code and abstracting ideas, uh, and it, make, it will make easier to to have a, to to build a nice library. Um, then I want to talk about a bunch of properties that good um, good libraries, in my opinion, share. Uh, and the first property, I think, a good library should be extensible. So when I when I write a library, I try to make it as extensible as possible uh, because ex you can cover all the use cases your users are going to have because you don't know which one they are. Um, so when you write um, a library with extensibility in mind, you're basically covering your ass for when people are gonna have problems that you didn't think about uh, when writing the library. So, and you're gonna tell them, write it yourself and plug it in, because that's, that's what extensibility is about, basically. Um, and Elixir is, has a lot of extensibility in itself, so it's, it's a core concept, I think, of the, of the language already. So if you write a library for Elixir, really, really, it just makes sense that you, um, Share this con concept as well, and I think a good uh, a good way to um, uh, think about this is to have like an eighty twenty rule, uh, where uh, what I mean is have eighty percent of the of the use cases common use cases covered already in your library, but have um, so that have them built in your library and have the rest the um, remaining twenty percent extensible. What I mean by this is make your libra library extensible so that you can plug in everything. And then provide, through that extensibility mechanism, provide already a bunch of stuff that does the most common things, the most common use cases, covers the most common use cases. And the rest 20%, you leave to the users that, are, that have like, more complex use cases or weirder use cases uh, to implement themselves. And I think a really, really good example in Elixir of this um, is mixed shell. So mixed shell is a behavior for um, mixed shells. Uh, and basically, it, it, it defines the behavior on how, how a shell that mix uses should behave. Um, and already having this, this behavior and having the shell configurable, so the shell is configurable at runtime in mix, and having that configurable at runtime means that um, there's already the 20% of extensibility is already there. So basically, uh, if I want to write a complex shell, I can write, I can write it and just plug it in. Uh, but Elixir already provides three like, very common use cases, they, they're covered in the standard library. So the first shell, mix IO, just shell IO, just writes to IO, uh, to the terminal. Uh, shell process sends a message to yourself when, when you print something on the shell and makes shell quiet, doesn't like silence its whole messages. Um, so these are pretty common use cases and they're already covered because you don't want to be writing this because uh, that's the 80% of the use cases will be uh, using one of those, those three. Uh, but the rest, the, resting, the rest of the use cases that you can cover, you leave to extensibility by having uh, the library configurable at runtime. Um, and another extensibility point is uh, get out of jail points. Uh, so I read this in some blog post, uh, but this, I think this is a, 
uh, way you fix. So there, I read something else on a different blog post uh, called the law of leaky abs abstractions. Uh, and this mentioned that, basically said that uh, every abstraction uh, you think of, every abstraction you do uh, is gonna leak at some point. Uh, it's, it's if it's complex, complex enough. So leaking means uh, that you abstract something and then you lose something that you could do before abstracting just because you abstracted this, because you have this abstraction. So the law, so this is where you leak, the abstraction leaks. And if you have get out of jail points, it's kind of a way to um, pl plug the leak basically. Uh, and get out of jail points are points in, uh, where in your library or abstraction in general where you can just uh, go to the, to the lower level of abstraction. And a good example uh, to make this concrete is, is Acto. So Acto is this like a query, query um, database framework for Elixir. Uh, and it has a very rich query language built in Elixir. Um, but this query language can't, uh, since Acto supports multiple databases, this query language can't um, support everything that databases support because there's there will some, something that some data, only some database supports. Uh, there will be weird stuff that you can do. Um, so the way to obviate that is they provide the fragment uh, macro where basically uh, you can pass any query string uh, to the fragment macro and you still get um, interpolation. So the question mark there, you still get like uh, uh, escaping and, and sanitization and all the stuff. Uh, you still get some compile time benefits, uh, but you can use any arbitrary exp SQL expression in the, uh, in the fragment. Um, and this, this is basically how you bypass the abstraction that Acto, so the, the abstraction of the query, uh, um, query language you, is bypassed by using fragment, basically. Um, so this is how you don't leak uh, anymore, basically. Uh, so extensibility is a pretty good, uh, pretty good requirement for a good library, I think. Um, another one is composability. So a good library should be, I think, composable with other libraries because uh, if it's not, it's hard to use, use, use it usually. Um, and the way you make, I think, libraries composable, um, there's a bunch of advice that I have is, first one, I think this is the most important one, uh, is to use the language feeders. So if you, if you use the feeders of the language you're writing the library in, um, this library is naturally gonna com compose well with the language, and if other libraries use the same features, it's not really gonna compose well with the other libraries as well. And I have a really good example, I think, um, with streams. So Elixir has streams, which are like infinite, infinite, uh, possibly infinite, lazy collections. Um, and so me, uh, me and a coworker were, wrote a Cassandra driver, um, I'm into database drivers apparently. Um, and he wrote a, we wrote a Cassandra driver um, and Cassandra supports streaming queries where you, uh, paging queries basically, where you uh, have a query and fetch out um, only like uh, pages of results from the database. Not, you don't fetch out the whole, uh, the whole result set. Um, and the way you, so the way we model that in the driver is to basically have um, stream pages function. So the stream pages function uh, takes a query and returns a stream. So right away, if you call this, it doesn't do anything. It just builds a data structure. And it returns a stream. Uh, and this stream is a stream of pages of results, basically. Um, and now that I have this, and the stream is a concept that exists in Elixir, so it's a concept that the language provides. So now that I have this stream, I can combine it with other features of the language, and I can process it using tools that are in the language that I don't have to write in the library. Um, and so, for example, we could do, um, task async stream is a, is a function that takes a stream and maps uh, a function over the stream in parallel. And so since it takes a stream, we can just pass the Xandra stream and we can map a function over these uh, pages of results in parallel. So when task async stream asks the stream of pages for a, for a page, then we will actually do the query and we will spawn a process and, and process the results in the different process. Um, and then we can do something like enumerate reduce and like combine results or, or do whatever. And the nice thing is that uh, in, this, in this snippet of code, only the first line we wrote, the rest is just for free because we're using the right abstraction, the right uh, feeder that the language provides. Uh, and the nice thing is that potentially uh, I can write after task async stream, since task async stream returns a stream, I can provide I, something that processes a stream after that. Uh, and I would have 
composability in all the in all the directions basically out of my library into my library uh, so you can you can do uh, you can combine it very easily um, so another thing that I think is really important when doing uh, for um, composability is to know existing conventions so when there's a language convention uh, it's usually good to follow the same convention because you may have many libraries that follow the same conventions uh, and this way they're easier to compose. So for, for example, um, if you're writing a library that uh, provides, say, a function that does something and returns a result, and it can error out, if you return something like this, so you, you'll have, uh, like this is a pretty, pretty strong convention, I would say, in the Elixir community, and you would have uh, ways to compose, compose this function with uh, other functions and with other libraries because, this, because they all deal with something like that. And uh, another example would be if you return error uh, exception instead of, instead of a ter generic term, then you would have e even more, uh, like th this is not a really a convention yet, but uh, you would have even more composability because then you get an error which is an exception. An exception is already an Elixir feeder that you can, can compose with other, other things. Uh, and one thing you can do is you can transform it to a message and log it or you can raise it or you can give it to another library that takes exceptions, for example, and does something with them reports them to um, uh, never reporting service uh, or something like that. Uh, and then I think that, um, so extensibility, composability, pretty good um, criteria. And if uh, focus, I think, is really good uh, to have in the library as well. So when you write a library uh, or use a library, um, you, like the idea is to try to have a library that is focused on doing one thing and doing, doing it well. And this plays very, very well with composability because if you have a library that works very well on one problem and it's composable, then you can solve like, a more complex problem by just composing the libraries uh, and composing the tools uh, and it's gonna be uh, easier. Uh, so another thing that a good library, uh, I think, should have is easiness of use. So if, if, if you write a library and it's not easy to use, it's gonna be hard to have people use it. Uh, and if you use a library, it's gonna be hard to use it if it's not easy to use. So, um, and to be easy to use, um, I think consistency is a good, uh, is a good thing to, to strive for. So the prin principle of least astonishment is something that says, um, try to do what the, don't break the expectations of the user basic, users basically. So try to do what the users uh, expect, expect the library to do. Um, so consistency is one thing that makes the libraries easier to use. Transparency, I think. So this is a quite important point. Uh, I really like when I when I do a library and where I, when I when I do a library, I strive for this, and when I make and when I use a library, I try to use one that strives for this. Uh, but the idea is that to make a library that is uh, transparent enough that so it, the abstraction is thin enough that you can see through. Uh, what this means is. Um, if you abstract away too much, it then it becomes like super painful to, um, for example, understand for, to understand what's going on, and then to debug stuff, and then to understand uh, how resources are allocated. So resources is a good example of, of this. So when I when I um, designed Redix, the first thing I did is I said, so Redix is just going to give you one connection to Redis, and then you manage how many of them you want to open, uh, for how many is good for your application. Uh, you decide if you're gonna open them on demand uh, or keep them open. So I give, like, I, uh, the decision was to give control of this to the user um, instead of deciding, instead of having, so, and this is, so Jose mentioned about Gen, Gen HTTP this morning, and this, I think it's a pretty good, uh, it plugs really well here, because right now all the HTTP clients that we have they take a lot of decisions for you. So they decide how to, how to do pooling, they decide how to do session, they decide how to do uh, redirects, they decide, so they take, take, they take a lot of decisions uh, that maybe you should be taking. Um, so they're not, the abstraction is not thin, it's quite, quite large because they do the protocol parsing, the actual network stuff, then the pooling, uh, all this stuff uh, in, the, in a single library. Uh, but it would be much easier to work with something that is composable uh, and that is smaller. And then you can do, you can decide how many, how to fit the pieces and how many pieces you want, basically. Um, and to have an easy to use library, you gotta have great errors. So the code above, you never do it. I will hunt you if, if I find this code. 
so this, this, leads to, this leads to match error, which is the worst error you're gonna have uh, because it doesn't say anything. So it's not even, I don't think it's okay to have it in your application code. If you have it in the library, you're, you're a criminal, basically. Um, and it, so when you, get, when you get this, you're saying, you know that something can, can go wrong. Uh, and if you assert that something is not wrong, then it's gonna blow up at some point and then people have to go read the source code. And source code is not, is not a good way to, to learn about libraries, which brings me to the next point, which is documentation. So you gotta have documentation. I think documentation is super important for you, first of all. So I, when I write documentation, I write it for myself, because like when I'm, gonna go, when I'm gonna use the library in six months, the library that I wrote, I don't wanna go look at the source code to understand what's going on. I, wanna, like, I always wanna be just a user of the library. I just wanna go to the documentation and say, oh, this is, this is how it's done. I don't wanna go, because I don't remember the source code after six months. So, uh, so if you write, write documentation for yourself, it's good. And then it's good for other people as well, but we don't care about other people, that's, that's the point. So, but write it for yourself, it's gonna, it's gonna be really nice. Um, so we talked about what um, is a software library and um, why do we design them, the idea is that we designed them to abstract complex code um, or to abstract um, ideas and patterns. So I think these are the two polarizing um, parts, basically polarizing the types of libraries. Uh, and then there's everything in between. But I think when designing, it's good to strive for, um, to, strive, to try to lean on, on one side, basically. Uh, and then I said, uh, some, like, I give some, gave some tips about designing libraries. One of them is, uh, to make them extensible so that they play well with the language and with other libraries, uh, to make them, um, sorry, extensible so that, that users can extend them, um, composable so that they can play well with the rest uh, of the ecosystem and the language, and make them easy to use so that they're easy to use for you and, and other people, and um, that was basically it. So uh, I, the, the idea was I hope that I gave you um, criterion tools to build software library and to, and to um, build good software libraries and to uh, recognize when a software library is worth using um, and when, a, when it looks like a good library uh, and things to, I don't know, uh, decide if it's, if it's a good library or not so that we can all improve the ecosystem. And last thing, the Wookiee, is Jose here? No, so the Wookiee joke this morning, that was like textbook joke, I think he probably read it off of Wikipedia or something. Oh, you gave more laughs, laughs to him, so just. <laughs> yeah. Super. Well, thanks a lot. That was, uh, that was great and good for a laugh, as always. <laughs> uh, so does anyone have any questions? I can bring the mic over uh, if you have a question. So just raise your hand, and I'll come on over. Super. Uh, my question, uh, you wrote libraries for both Redis and Cassandra adapters, right? Yeah. Uh, why did you make like a, a standalone adapters instead of an Ecto adapters? So Redis, Redis doesn't really make sense with Ecto because Ecto is a, like for mm. relation, kind of relational databases. So, but Cassandra, there is an adapter out there, I think, uh, for Ecto, but I don't know, we don't need Ecto, so we wrote it at work because we needed it, uh, and we don't need Ecto for what we're using it for, so we didn't, we didn't look into it, but I believe it's hard, it will be hard to make Ecto play with, so Cassandra is, is a key value store after all, so it, I don't know how well it would play with, with Ecto, and uh, it doesn't have things like foreign keys, it doesn't, I mean, uh, the query language is, is different than, than SQL databases. I mean, it's similar in syntax, but uh, meanings can be different. And so I'm not sure how well it will work, but there is one out there, so maybe it works. Yeah. All right, thanks. No worries. Super, anyone else have a question? There's a story in the monocle. Uh, there's where no I'm missing. In a monocle. There's no sorry in a monocle. Just Pardon me? <laughs> there's no sorry in a monocle. There's no, no one in a monocle. I'm just joking. Oh, okay. <laughs> Your jokes are, they always go over my yeah, head. Yeah, too <laughs> smart. They're too smart. <laughs>
So not always. I, I get some of them. I do get some of them. So, um, all right, going once, going twice. Last chance for a question before we break. All right, so that's it. That's a wrap. Um, thanks very much for a super presentation.